Good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to our webinar this afternoon on rethinking recruitment and tourism. This is the first of three webinars in the series designed to support you in your recruitment efforts in this very challenging and competitive labour market at the moment. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, cover some housekeeping matters with you at the moment. If we can put up the slides, please. Thank you. So just for the benefit of everybody today, we'd like you to sit back, relax and listen uh, to uh, the content we have for you. Uh, we will actually be recording the session today and we'll place a copy of the recording in our business support hub along with the slides from our expert panelists today that will be available to you tomorrow uh, onwards and we'll drop you a communication note tomorrow to that effect. Just to say to you, all attendees, videos and audios are muted for the benefit of uh, avoiding interruption and background noise. But if you do want to post a question, please do so in the question panel to the top right of your screen if you want to undock that and post your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions, uh, but if we don't get around to everything, we'll cover others in an FAQ uh, in the following days uh, on that. But we will have some time for questions uh, following the presentations. And if you do experience any audio difficulties, remember you can click on join audio or join meeting by phone. Um, and finally, just to say that we really do want to encourage participation today uh, and to ensure we hear as many voices as possible. So we will be encouraging audience polls, uh, your engagement with the audience polls throughout the session. Um, so please do get involved in those. It will give you an idea of where you stand in conjunction with other people who are, uh, I suppose, grappling with this same challenge as you. So it will be good to hear kind of how others are responding to and reacting to the current challenges. So without further ado, we'll move on to look at the agenda. Then for today, we've got a fairly full action packed uh, agenda. Uh, to begin with, I'm just going to ask our head of tourism careers, our acting head of tourism careers, Sarah Dolly, to give you a little bit of context for today. Uh, we'll then look at the recruitment process and workforce audiences and how we get to know those audiences in a way so we can respond and tailor our uh, road profiles and job adverts to suit those. We'll have a look at the recruitment marketplace and the importance of your employer brand, and we'll have Chris Pay from Jobs.ie to do that with us. Uh, then we look at the whole area of marketing your job, designing the ad, choosing the right channels, and a look at who's innovating and some really good practice out there that's starting to be seen uh, in the marketplace. And finally, then we'll look at some practical advice and tips just to ensure that we're doing all this in the context of being legally compliant. So we'll have Caroline Reedy back from the, with us from the HR suite to have a look at that. And following that, then we'll have quick some a uh, quick question and answer session and I'll wrap up then with some key takeaways. So without further ado, I'm actually going to ask uh, Sarah to actually give us uh, an introduction to today. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Dolly. I'm the Acting Head of Tourism Careers here at Falch Ireland. And I just want to start by thanking you all for joining our session this afternoon. We know it's an incredibly busy time for businesses at the moment, so we do appreciate you joining us today. We know that one of the key challenges for businesses at the moment is recruiting and retaining the staff you need to fully reopen and recover from the impact of the pandemic on your business, with tens of thousands of vacancies right across the country and across all roles. So today, we're kicking off at the first in a three-part live webinar series that'll help you in some of the critical stages of your recruitment process. So from enhancing your role profiles and creating engaging job ads that'll help you stand out and gain traction with potential employees to pitching your business and what you can offer, as well as ensuring that when you do secure the staff, that they're effectively onboarded, inducted, and more likely to be retained. So to help you do this at a time when it's never been so competitive and it really is the employee's market, we have some expert tips and insights from best in class recruitment and selection experts. So I'm delighted today to welcome Natasha Dowd from Ancora, uh, Chris Payne from Jobs.ie, Ashley McVeigh from The New Collective, and Caroline Reedy from the HR Suite. So thank you all for joining our session today. As well as this webinar series, over the coming weeks and months, Fall Giant will work hand in glove with the industry to support you in your recruitment drive through a range of different initiatives. So this will include things like a campaign to drive awareness of your vacancies, support to access key pools of talent both here and overseas, as well as helping you to rebuild the skills and capability that have been lost in your business over the course of the pandemic. 
We will also work with the industry to reposition careers in tourism and hospitality to help ensure a future pipeline of talent and to showcase the best of careers and employers in the industry. So make sure to keep an eye out on fallsireland.ie forward slash tourism careers where we will keep you posted on new initiatives that will help support your recruitment. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Amanda and Amanda is in the enterprise development team and she's going to take you through today's session. So thanks again, everybody. And I really hope you enjoy the session and that helps you in your recruitment drive. Thanks again. Thanks, Sarah. So before I introduce our first panelist uh, today, Natasha Dowd from Ankara, we might just take that first audience poll question um, at Rachel, please, on the screen. So we're going to start you with something simple here. Um, and this first question is simply, uh, how have your recruitment methods changed over the last two years? So have they changed? Yes or no? Uh, Annie, uh, your, your, it, your responses are most welcome with that. And while we take your answers on that, I'm going to introduce Natasha. So Natasha comes to us with over 25 years experience in recruitment across Ireland, the UK and the US, having had an in-depth understanding of the challenges and demands of the changing talent marketplace and our corporate training experience spans a range of service industries across recruitment, HR, learning and development, sales and customer service. Uh, and having successfully coached and trained recruitment teams uh, to win talent and deliver year on year growth in business targets, we're really delighted to have Natasha on board. But just before I pass over to her, uh, Rachel, we might give us your answers there on that poll, if you don't mind. OK, so for 70 percent of you, your recruitment methods have changed, so it'll be great to hear more about that. Uh, but for 30% of you, you're saying, no, nothing has changed in how we're doing things. So that's an interesting point. And Natasha, maybe we'll hand over to you and we'll come back to these comments afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you all today. My name is Natasha Dow. The company is Ancora. My experience is in recruitment. I facilitate train and coach within the industry and myself and the contributors today are aiming through the webinar this webinar series to provide you with practical step-by-step -step guidance and some tactical tools to make it easier for you to adapt your recruitment strategy and be successful in attracting and selecting the best talent okay next slide We will step you through the six stages in recruitment throughout the whole of the three webinar series. And I will begin today by covering the recruitment process and the workplace audiences. You can see the image on the slide. This is the image of a recruitment circle. And the screen shows the six stages in the recruitment process. And they're dependent on the size of your business. There may be one person responsible for this, or you might have an entire HR department to look after it in which case this recruitment process may be coordinated by them. But regardless of who's guiding the different steps to be, defining the job role, creating the job ads, screening candidates, or maybe being part of the interview and marketing the job, it is important to be structured in your approach and apply consistent standards throughout. Even with a back of house show or meet the team for a chat, involving members of your team in the process, it can be a very positive if it's done well and it helps candidates to get a feel for the people and for the organisation. The first stage is prepare, and this is when you are considering the need for the employee role, how it is to be filled, and when you defer, we determine the role profile. This is when you also determine the remuneration and the benefits package. When defining the role and the likely candidate requirements, knowing your target audience is important. Who are the workforce prospective applicants you want to attract? Where are they typically hanging out? or the communication channels through which you can reach them is important. That's it. Apologies about that. So your next slide is knowing your audience, okay. Our workforce is diverse. We have different generations all working in the workforce at the same time and within a competitive market for talent. It's important to be understanding and be aware of the cultural differences, the aspirations, the values, and their preferred communication channels. Aim to adopt a customer-centric approach. Get to understand and think the prospective applicants that you want to attract. 
put yourself in the mindset of someone searching for work and what they consider important to them in the work life. It may be the social aspect of meeting people or a job that flexes around family or college commitments or a job that offers serious career development prospects. Think of the media channels and think about how you, what you will use to reach and to promote the jobs. Each of these generations are not all hanging out on the same media channels. Think of what and how important are the values that they look for in an organisation. And then think about how you attract customers to your business. You provide what your customer is looking for as part of the sales pitch for your business or your product or service. So we need to think similarly in creating a pitch for attracting candidates. Looking at the image, you can see how characteristics of different generations towards work over time have formed. And as an employee, you should consider the opportunities this brings and consider how you can offer employment to someone, for example, that wants hours to suit their lifestyle. Be mindful that every generation and individual brings something unique and valuable to the workforce. And when attracting talent, craft your message, appeal to diverse candidates and be open to their wants, but recognise the benefits to you as the employer. If we look at baby boomers and we look at the in more detail in a moment on the next slide, but we look at them on this slide, for example, they bring a wealth of knowledge and their circumstances and lifestyle could mean that they're more likely to be attracted to work in shorter blocks of fixed or consistent hours within a profession that they are skilled in already or a new skill that provides them with opportunity to apply their life skills and customer service experience in meeting people to balance which for them might otherwise be a sense of isolation, for example, if they were in retirement. As we move through the generations in the workforce, you have Gen X, Gen Y and Z. These are attracted to work opportunities which will allow them to have a work-life balance and one that considers their personal well-being. They look for jobs that will add to their skills and open up career paths and further work opportunities. They want to work for employers who have values and align them with their workforce or an employer who provides benefits that enable them to invest in themselves through personal development or who could provide flexible op options in the working hours. In the following slides, we will look at these profiles and provide a brief overview of each generation and gain a little bit more insight into the varied characteristics and consider these when attracting talent during the recruitment process. If we look at maturers and baby boomers, for example, they look for flexibility in hours and the opportunity to mentor others amongst the wants that they need for their generation. Combine this with their transferable skills, looking at working part time and also access to extra income. These wants apply to both industry skilled, who, look, who may look to return back to the industry, or others who, who are seeking to stay connected and apply their life skills to a team. Maybe they're seeking work on a part time basis but would want to work full time if it didn't affect their finances and pension. These are most likely maturists or baby boomers, boomers, but could also be someone from Gen X. And we'll look at these now. Gen X value and want a work-life balance. There is an emphasis on education and opportunities to learn and grow. They welcome the opportunity to complete their work with hours that allow them to combine it with their family commitments and keep a clear separation between their work and family life or to pursue personal interests. Most likely Gen X, but could also be Gen Y. The benefits to you as an employer brings added value in leadership, management or team skills. And it's also an opportunity to retain staff through a stable and flexible work option aligning with their external commitments. Gen Y. Gen Y seek and want a flexible work-life balance. They seek employers with strong brand values and authenticity. Corporate and social responsibilities combined with opportunities to learn and grow, along with being a contributor and being recognised and rewarded. They may be in the workplace already, but they may want to work for the right employer aligned with their beliefs. Or maybe they're a college student seeking part-time work around college commitments. They're likely to be Gen Y, but could also be Gen Z as a new entrant into the industry. As a benefit to you as an employer, this brings potential added value to future skills and an opportunity to retain staff when the role fits their work-life balance and corporate values. Finally, we look at Gen Z. Gen Z are digitally driven, brought up in an era of social and technological change. 
This generation seek rewarding and meaningful work where brand values are integrated with corporate responsibility and where diversity, equality and inclusivity are part of the working environment. They want to continuously teach, to learn and grow within the organisation or from others within the organisation. They are seeking to develop a career pathway and need to be attracted to the tourism and hospitality industry with these wants in mind. The benefits to you as an employer would be a positive return to your people investment with a clear career path with roles that fit in with their goals and corporate values. By attracting and building diverse teams, you can leverage the strengths and benefits across generations, whilst also encouraging team building, collaboration and relationship building. So these slides are a sample of the many traits and wants of different employees at different stages of their career or life. And as you move to the next stage of preparing the job role, they provide an oversight of what wants attract individuals in the workplace. So when you're connecting to your audience, what are they thinking? When you're developing a job role, for example, in an advert, you need to ensure that you think like a prospective target audience. And we provide insights and information to them on the various questions they are likely to have in their job seeking journey. And the questions that they ask themselves when comparing your job with others. Apply a, a customer centric approach and promote your brand throughout the candidate journey. That's extremely important. Communication is always key. Keep them informed and provide feedback. And as this will impact your brand if it's not managed effectively. Use the opportunity to provide an enjoyable experience with candidates who will remember how they were treated, similar to how you treat your customers. And think like the candidate, as if you were applying for the job. And ask yourself, have you prepared your business for attracting talent? Have you got a clear and insightful message of what you can offer to them as an industry of choice to work in? Have you worked through a plan to ensure that that message is at every point of the recruitment process? Let's look at some of the questions the candidates will be asking about. On perception, they'll be looking to see how are you perceived? Candidates will research your company, most likely via your website or online, and this is instant information. The information is at their fingertips and creates a first impression and perception of how they perceive your business. They will ask, what does your business stand for? How do employees describe what your business is? And what do your customers think? If you have reviews, do you respond to those reviews online and acknowledge them? They will look at the industry as a whole and what opportunities are open to them as a career path. Will your business provide them with a job that will enhance their skills? Will it see them on the road towards their career path? Or is there opportunity to join the industry in a job that fits their lifestyle? Does your website, does your website talk to the talent? Does it provide a call to action at which they can apply for a job? And how are you expressing this role profile in a job advert? Are there contact details of an individual who they can reach out to within your organisation if they want to ask further questions? Do your emails have a standard signatory at the bottom, at the bottom which includes a link to the jobs that you currently have open? We all have standard signatories but, and we also usually have the website link, but we don't actually have a link that takes us to open opportunities on the jobs. And we should be using that all of the time in communication. Your values are the guiding principles that shape your business and what's important to you as a business. They are what makes your organisation stand out, good or bad, to prospective employees. And they evidence how you treat people and how you have treated your current or past employers, employees. Sorry. If we were to ask your current or past employees a question, what are the benefits and advantages of working with you over others, what would they say? And how do you portray yourself as an employer in the community? Because it's about your reputation. They tell the story of the, to the candidate of what importance you place on people, ethics and behaviours. The story of your values should be promoted throughout the recruitment journey and through social media to reach as much of an audience by showcasing what you do and how you do it. So let's take a look at the role profile and job advert and how you can convey your employer brand in the role profile and job advert and align your values with both. You'll see from this, from this image you've got the role profile and this is what the employer will use to determine what the potential application, applicant will bring to the job. It is generally an internal document created for the role and also provides detailed information to the employee on what they need to do to perform in the role and to determine if the job or employer matches their needs. 
it gives the employee the opportunity to present the employer brand and helps with creating the job advert. With the job description, it shows the duties, responsibilities and how poor performance is evaluated to the employee. It is an important tool and it's, it's good to support yourself when you're doing the interview process and it enables you to design questions which will focus on identifying matching skills, experience and attributes. The job description also helps the employer to develop the contract, set targets and evaluate performance. Content here is important as you start to prepare to source for talent and building the profile and description of the prospective candidate. The key content. You'll see here that it's listed content for the role profile and it includes the job title, the summary about the role and how it values as value to the organisation. You have company information where you should include your employer brand information and including values. And job requirements and job benefits, a call to action and consider including staff testimonials similar to what your team will say about working with you. With you. And build a picture of what working with your organisation will be like and of course the pay range information. With the job description, build more of the tasks and responsibilities and any relevant skills or experience and what performance looks like in the job to reach success. Show where they fit in with the job within the organisation, their authority and responsibility and talk about how they work and expected behaviour in the work. Me back here, excuse me. Defining the role profile. In this slide, you can see the key content is populated. You've got the job title, which you must define. It's very, very important because candidates are driven by titles. Examples of some are listed here as well, and together with alternative descriptors that may be considered. You have the job summary, and use this section to outline the key aspects of the job to promote your brand value and what you do. Avoid jargon such as hard working or fast paced because it can be perceived negatively. And let's look at an example of a role profile. You will find a sample of this role profile on the Business Support Hub and you will have opportunity to look at it in more detail in your own time and the content to see um, how it is laid out. At the moment we're showing a, a small portion of it. But this rail profile breaks down the key content for a bartender role. And you can see from the about us and why I work with us that you get a feel for the role as it immerses the candidate in the type of business that they are passionate about and their environment and the people values. They talk about what they are known for winning awards and how it impacts their staff and who benefit from the accolades. And importantly, they talk about what they can do for candidates. Investing in continuous development, inclusivity by working with their suppliers and experts and how the role is valuable to help them grow their reputation. It has content which talks to a diverse audience with different wants. The next stage will be to advertise the job and Chris will be providing more insight with this. Thank you for listening and before Chris takes you through the overview of the job advert, I will hand you back to Amanda. Thanks, Natasha. Well, there's really some food for thought there. And I was sitting there listening to my two Gen Z college students and the way they critique uh, and are very selective about the jobs that they go for and aligning with brand values. So definitely I can see how all that resonated. So some really good food for thought there and recognizing that actually the employment audience we're working towards are not a homogenous group anymore. And we need to talk specifically to their needs and their motivations. Uh, and I know Chris will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But before we uh, hand over to Chris, Rachel, we might take our next poll question, please, if that's OK on the screen. So what resources do you engage to assist your recruitment? Uh, so select all that apply uh, and whether that is in-house, a specialist agency or headhunter, jobs, board or aggregator sites, the traditional and or digital adverts that you may pay for, and are you looking at international recruitment platforms? So please select all of those that apply there. 
And while we take your answers on that, I'm now going to introduce and welcome Chris Payne, GM of Jobs.ie. Chris began his career in recruitment some 15 years ago after graduating from UCD. So Chris, I think it's fair to say you don't know anything else other than this landscape. Uh, but within five years, Chris had uh, progressed to Director of Sales uh, with Irish Jobs, and then he moved from Irish from IrishJobs.ie to Jobs.ie, a sister company as general manager in 2017, to oversee the operations of the e-recruitment platform. And since Jobs.ie was born, in actual fact, it's been a common leader in recruitment and hospitality sector. And Chris has fast become an expert and a consultation partner in recruitment for many hospitality clients in Ireland. So, Chris, before I pass over to you, can we just take the poll results there, Rachel? Uh, on this in terms of who's using what. Okay, so great to see a lot of people, the majority sitting and looking at that in-house because I don't think it's a case of an either or. Um, about 50% there on headhunters, 68% uh, uh, using job boards and aggregator sites. Chris, you'll be happy to know that. And the traditional and digital ads there are growing in numbers as well at 77% with about 43% of you looking at international platforms. So an interesting mix there. Great to see people applying a mix of platforms. So Chris, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Emil, Amanda, and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to speak uh, briefly just about some trends that are happening right now in uh, the e-recruitment area, and then a few tips. Um, which will follow on from from what Natasha spoke about. So um, I think we're in uh, presentation mode here at the moment. Um, so I'll I'll give you a second to to fix that. But <clears throat> where I'm going to start is 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 the e recruitment trends. Um, so I'm just going to wait a couple of seconds for the slides. So uh, while, while we're getting that onto full screen, I'll, I'll continue on anyway. And um, I suppose what the first thing we're seeing is that the marketplace is, is moving very, very fast at the moment. It's it's fast. What we're in job study, we're currently seeing 17% extra visits year on year. And we know unemployment is falling. So I think what that means is that it's actually the market of movement has returned. And, and that's something we've seen in the past after recessions where people who have jobs don't move around, but now we're seeing people starting to go, well, hold on, I, I can look around. And, and that's really important, therefore, that we uh, are, are aware that the great, great resignation isn't happening at the pace people thought it might, but certainly people are starting to look for jobs again. The good news for people on this call is, uh, it, in January, our top two, two of our top three categories visited were hotels and restaurant and catering so people are looking to come back into the sector i think there was a fear that people wouldn't want to come back into the sector it might be seen as too volatile with everything happening and that isn't the case uh, so the good news is people are looking and applying for those jobs um, part-time is for the first time in in the 15 years that i'm in the business we haven't seen it as the top keyword uh, and i think natasha spoke about it and i, and I found the slides really interesting because Work-life balance is something that has is, that is shifted. I know even for myself, I, I look at it now and go, well, what was work-life balance before uh, the pandemic certainly isn't that for me anymore. Dropping my daughter to crash at half seven and picking her up at half six isn't something I want to do anymore. So I need more work-life balance. And that's what we're seeing here. And I do think there's one other side to it. We're all getting a little more squeeze. Everything is costing more. So there are people we're seeing coming back into the marketplace who haven't really been here in a long time and are looking to work part time. So that's something that we need to bear in mind. We have to fit uh, to people's life as much as they have to fit to our, our, our positions we're advertising for. So that's all really good news, of course. And um, people are applying for jobs. They're looking for jobs in the sector. But unfortunately, supply is is way, way outweighing demand. So what we saw last month was an increase year on year of over 400 percent in jobs advertised so that's where your employer brand comes into it and is really really important you have to stand out and that's why it matters and um, it's really it's, it's becoming harder and harder to attract people so when you attract them you need to train them and and, and retain them so how do you do that well i think uh, what 
we're not good at within the hospitality sector is actually shouting about why it's such a good sector to work in. And if I go back to the fact that people are feeling a little bit more squeezed, what do you, what do you guys offer that other businesses can't? And there's things I often think about, you know, I was looking through some job specs on the site this morning and I didn't see one restaurant talking about how they give employees a meal, but we know that most of them do and it's almost unwritten, but then we should write it down because we know Gen, Gen Y, Gen Z, they want to see this stuff. They want perks and, and, and they want to see it. Uh, same with a hotel, could be offering discounted rates to, to, to staff on, on spa treatments or do you have a sister hotel? Are you in Cork City with a sister hotel in West Cork? That's really important um, because they might be able to use that at a, at a reduced rate. And that's the type of stuff now that job seekers are looking for and we're not seeing enough of it in the job specs and that's what they want to see. The other, the other thing is all of you will be brilliant at social media because that's what you do. You'll put up, look at this beautiful meal or it might be our fab new outdoor area that's, that's really, really important during COVID and look at our heaters. But what you sometimes forget and we don't see enough of, and it was referenced again by, by Natasha, is what, what do we do to, with our staff? Why do they like working for us? And I, I'll give an example. I, my local coffee shop is, is actually a cake studio in Marley Park. And I've gotten to know the staff really well and over COVID because I was there every day. And one of the things that, that I do is I follow them on Instagram. And it was a really wet, blustery, windy day recently. And I was watching them on Instagram and they were all doing Irish dancing very, very badly. But I was kind of thinking to myself, doesn't that look like a good place to work? And they're actually hiring at the moment for a barista and a baker. And I was like, well, if I'm a barista or a baker, maybe that's the type of place I want to work because it looks like a bit of crack. And, and I was thinking to myself, the owner of the business has given them that social media platform and allowed them to showcase the, the, the brand in another way. And that is really important and they'll be interested in, in, in working there. So just some very, very quick tips. Um, you, we need to start thinking mobile first and it's not just about how the job is advertised, where do they apply? So for jobs.ie, most clients just receive applications into our back office. But some of them ask us, can you link away to our careers page? And we'll do it, no problem. But what sometimes happens is they go on, people are doing about 60% of applications are coming through mobile now. They'll go on, click through to this careers page, and they haven't optimized that page for mobile. So they can't find how to apply. It's really, really difficult, and you'll lose applications. So think mobile first. Uh, everything needs to be simple and clear. You know, this is how we flick through now. That's how we... That's how we use our phones when we're looking for jobs. So really important that they're landing on the stuff that's important to them. Like make sure that you highlight the perks, make sure that it's, it's clearly laid out what the skills and competencies are. Uh, use simple and clear job titles. So if it's a sales executive, make sure it's the sales executive. It doesn't need to be sales executive hyphen Galway, hyphen OTE. That actually will limit your applications where people sometimes think it increases it. The technology will do that work for you. That's our job to make sure that we're, we're matching the right people. We're already doing that. We're using cookies and things like that to make sure that if someone is, is using uh, jobs.ie and they apply for this role, we know they're a good match for that role. So we're pushing them. We, you don't need to do it. So in, in summary, um, and I'll leave you with this is, just be confident about what, what you have to offer. Remember that it is a good sector to work in. It suits so many people's lifestyles and be sure, be sure to shout about that. What do you then as a business have to offer in terms of those extra perks that can add to people's flexibility and what they're earning? Um, your employer brand is always on, so remember that and use it to your advantage. Like Restaurants, hotels will have more following than, than most businesses, so make sure that, that you're... They, the same people coming in and spending their money are the same people you're looking to employ. Um, remember what your competitors are offering. So within hospitality, especially, there's so many transferable skills into office work, but also into retail. So it's really, really important that you're, you're keeping an eye on what's happening in that market as well. Broaden your idea of the ideal candidate. So for example, is it two part-time workers to fit, so that you're fitting around the employee's lifestyle versus one full-time worker? Um, keep a talent pipeline and by that I mean think about your hiring process when you're saying no to someone 
There's nothing wrong with that, but give them clear feedback. Let them know that the door isn't closed. I'm giving you this feedback today, and maybe there'll be a position for you down the line. So keep that talent pipeline. They're also an advocate for you if you treat them well. Um, and cast your net wider. I think it was 43% of you are using international uh, ways of recruit, recruiting, which is really interesting. We are in Job City, part of a, a network of sites all over the world, um, just over 100 websites where you can actually use an account manager in Job City to you know, put a job on Info and Playo in Spain. So it's, it's interesting to see some of you are already doing that um, because it's, you know, bringing people in from abroad to work in these sectors is something that's always always worked really well. So on that note, um, I'll hand back over to Amanda and uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Chris. That's great. I mean, it's great to see such really practical advice from somebody really that's been at the cold face of it for so long. Uh, and so much of what you were saying there, Chris, was kind of reinforcing what Natasha is telling us about those workforce uh, generations. And also steps in really to uh, our next speaker, which is Ashling McVeigh from Danu Collective talking about the job advert. But just before we go to Ashling, we might just take our next poll question, please, Rachel, if that's okay. Um, so what digital platforms are proving the most effective in attracting operative level staff specifically? Now, we have another question on management staff, but let us know which ones you think are really proving to be most effective for you for operative staff. Is it in-house, your own efforts on terms of your website, uh, your um, community uh, newsletters, whatever the case may be, um, or is it specialist agency in-house? Is it job boards? Is it traditional ads or digital ads? Uh, and it's an international uh, recruitment platform. So while we take your answers on that, I'd now like to welcome Ashling McVeigh from Danu Collective. And Ashling enjoyed an early career in PR, communications, uh, events, and marketing across a range of industries, including hotels and restaurants, where she developed this absolute fascination for brands and how brands worked uh, before she launched Danu Collective. And we're delighted to have Ashling with us today because she really brings a wealth of experiences uh, from across businesses on the whole area of employer values and using that those values to develop your brand story and how you communicate that story then through a multitude of channels to really drive and ensure that you know your job ads are accessible but also that individuals can actually see themselves in those jobs and see themselves in those roles because that's really important to Chris's point in the current climate. I need to understand and feel that I can actually fit in there, that there's a sense of fun, there's a sense of team, and I can make a connection there. Because that's really ultimately what brings people to a job, but also what keeps them in a job, uh, very much so. So we might just take the res poll results there before I hand over to Ashling, if that's okay. So proving most effective, uh, standing out by a mile there, I think are the in-house efforts, uh, the job boards and aggregator sites again, Chris, and uh, interesting to see traditional and digital ads uh, proving very effective in that space as well. So without further ado, I'll hand you back now to Ashling, uh, who will take us through taking that role profile and creating the advert and then disseminating that successfully. Ashling, over to you. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everybody this afternoon. Um, fascinating insights and content so far. I've, I've learned a lot myself already, so hopefully um, you're all feeling the same. In this next section, we're going to look at the actual marketing of your job advert. Um, so we kind of build upon the context of what Natasha and Chris have taken you through and then how we can then go and create that job advert to really stand out in the marketplace. We know how competitive it is and how you can choose your, channel, your channels based on the actual workplace audience that you're going after. So if we kind of break this down into a step-by-step -step approach, um, Step one is to define that workplace audience. So I know Natasha took us through kind of every possible workplace audience that's out there. So it's to get really clear in our minds, who is it that we're targeting for specific roles? And then from there, step two is about reviewing the relevant communication channels that those um, audiences hang out on. So there's been some examples shared already um, by Natasha, but later on in this section, you're going to see that there are so many more, and they'll also be included in the guidance note on recruitment um, that you'll all have access to as you work through these series of webinars. Um, so very, very crucial that you get clear on who you're targeting and the channels that are going to allow you to reach them based on where they hang out. 
Step three then is obviously identifying the role profile, the job and the people spec. Um, so that's where you sit down. We've seen an example earlier in the session um, that Natasha took you through about how you can craft that role profile. But obviously if we're looking to post something on a tiny little tile um, on our Instagram feed, you know, all of that copy and those extended role profiles is going to get lost. So we need to find a way that we can firstly advertise to, to gain the attraction of who we're trying to target and then the call to action is to bring them onto the base wherever that extended um, job profile is sitting. Um, so we get that role, pro role profile very, very clear that outlines all of kind of our, our, our core messaging, our values, who we're looking for, what we can offer them. And then step four is crafting your ad message accordingly. So if you think of um, a two-page job profile and you have an opportunity to do an SMS blast and you can only include 40 characters in the SMS, so how are you going to condense that two page into those into those 40 characters? That's where you're going to look at really crafting that message accordingly. And then very often there will be an element of where you have to design a supporting creative. And that's like a graphic or a visual that accompanies the message. And this is very prevalent in social media, as you'll see as we work through the examples on the next few slides. So in essence, you've got five steps to follow. And what we're really looking to do is to tailor the message based on the target audience and the channel the exact same way as we would if we're trying to sell um you know, a Sunday roast to families or, um, you know, a, a, a double sweet to a family um, or a romantic couple. And then we want to make sure that we're packaging and presenting it in the right way that's going to get the attention of those we're looking to, to, to gain the attention from. So two examples here. It's the exact same profile, um, job profile, should I say, but we're looking at two different audiences. So we have Gen Y and we have Gen, Gen Z. But related to the audiences, we have two different channels that we have selected as part of our marketing campaign. The first channel is an SMS. So we see here how, how we've crafted our message and it's we're hiring. Johnny Max Bar is looking for passionate bartenders to join the family for flexible working hours, which we know on the back of what Chris has just uh, taken us through is very, very important and competitive pay. And um, the reason people work is obviously to earn that, that, that extra few bob. So competitive pay is important. And of course, the location in the heart of Kilkenny. We've given them three different um, key pieces of information there in this very short SMS. But what do we want them to do with that message? What's the call to action? So we're asking them to visit we'll include our link and of course it's for an opportunity for them to apply today. So that would be an example of an SMS. Same job, different uh, a, a different audience and different channel on the right here, it's an Instagram post. And this is where we might have an opportunity um, to build in um, some creative. Um, click the link to live chat today. So that would probably be more, more relevant if we were putting this into a story template, but it just shows again, the various ways um, that we need to craft our ad and of course um, the, the different graphics or non-graphics that you might need. Now looking at that design element, so many of you may have a graphic designer um, within your teams um, who, who'd be able to work with you alongside this, but if you don't, what are you going to do? There's a fantastic tool called Canva, which is an online platform that allows you to create um, lots of visual content from um, social media assets, presentations, you can do posters to pop in your window, lots of different things like that. There are a certain amount of um, free templates and of course there's also lots more um, for a very minimal fee for the paid account as well. But an example here is a barista. Um, obviously, a, a barista, it's the same profile, but we're looking at putting it um, out across a number of different channels and taking here, as an example, an Instagram feed, an Instagram story, and then we have a Facebook ad. So you can see these fabulous templates, very visually appealing. These are definitely going to stand out um, if they're popping up in my, in my own feed. Um, and these are all from Canva. Um, they can be tweaked and tailored based on uh, your own contact details, your own location, anything specific that you want to highlight. And uh, we've included a link here for you where you can access um, many more of those templates. So definitely something to check out um, if you don't have access to a graphic designer or the budget to invest in that and are tearing your hair out trying to create um, nice visual templates that are going to help you stand out. Canva is definitely um, one that I would recommend to start with. 
Next, um, Chris spoke in detail about the, employ uh, the importance of employer branding. Um, and a great example that we've seen is, is the Armada Hotel. If, if anybody is on the call today from Armada, you're doing an absolutely stellar job. And they've created um, this campaign around quest for the best. And it's all about these jobs by the sea. So in essence, um, we know that they're looking for some of the best talent out there. And it's all about um, you know, working by the sea. The visuals tell us that before we even read, read any words. And what they've really done that resonates so well with, with the workplace audiences is that they've created a series of videos that are sitting on their careers hub. And we can see here at the top, it's Tony, the, the bar manager, and Tony's out having a, a lovely refreshing dip um, in the ice cold sea, I'm sure. Um, but, but what a lovely thing to be able to do ahead of your shift um, or even to, to decompress after your working day. And then we have Magdalena then as well on the bottom, she's a designer um, in the hotel and she's here doing some yoga on the beach. So they're really showcasing the benefits um, of working with the property and all of the lovely things that you can do in your downtime and of course the location beyond just an office or, or the kitchen um, or the front desk where you're working. So some, some really good examples there. Then we see what we call the pull through. So how they pull through this um, campaign across um, Instagram in particular in this instance. And what they're doing is they're using really lighthearted and fun language that again is going to allow them to resonate with the market. So we see pillow fluffer instead of housekeeping, um, super smiler. So again, we're all about being host and hospitality. So that super smiler is very, very important. And of course, there's the early riser and the night sailor without referencing the fact that somebody is maybe going to be doing a night shift as a night porter. Or of course, if you're on breakfast, you're going to be up at the crack of dawn. So a very appealing um, way of communicating those certain aspects of the job. Moving on to the Marion Hotel, we want to highlight this as an example of um, a really great careers page. So they have this online careers hub on their website where they really go into detail about what it's like to work for the hotel. So you can really kind of get a sense of the brand, what they stand for, a day in the life, perhaps what behind the scenes is like. Um, you know, maybe how people progressed from where they started to where they are now. And again, it really helps to sell um, your um, business and, and attract the talent to come and work with you, especially if they perhaps are receiving two or three offers and they're in that decision making mode where they're trying to decide who to work for. Then we have 45 Park Lane and what they do really, really well is that they're bringing in the human touch, the personalization in a very, very simple way. So without having to create a very um, cost heavy marketing campaign, they've gone and just taken some visually appealing pictures of some of the staff across different areas. Very important to showcase the different disciplines within your business. And um, again, Chris spoke to that about, uh, you know, not just focusing on one area, but people do feel that they can come in work in hospitality and there's this opportunity to cross train and move within departments and, and really progress um, once they enter the industry. And again, some very lighthearted language um, being used here. Now we spoke about, um, I'm just gonna go back here for one second if we can, here we go. So um, we spoke about making it easy for candidates to apply. And I'm sure we've all been in the position where there, you see a job that seems very, very interesting. You'd love to apply. And then you realize it's probably going to take three evenings out of your week that you just don't have to go and do this big cover letter and fill out a huge application form. So you just don't go and do it. Um, so it's really important that we, we do make it easy to apply whilst still capturing the information that we need to capture. But one great example of this is LinkedIn and their apply now button which makes it really really easy for for candidates to express um, their interest online looking again at how we kind of really bring our brand to life in our job profiles and in our recruitment and um, communication and marketing the circular have um, posted recently two uh, jobs um, on Facebook um, which have received fantastic engagement and why we wanted to highlight these was how they use their tone of voice they're communicating exactly what we're trying to communicate like there's sociable hours you know you're not necessarily going to be working unsociable hours all the time there's huge scope for growth growth by them talking about that we are growing we have three bars and there is plenty of opportunity for you to grow it in the company so again they're kind of steering away from very heavy corporate professional speak knowing that they're trying to attract and um, perhaps um 
a, a, a younger, slightly hipster audience to work for them. And they're really using their brand tone of voice to connect with those particular people um, so that they can resonate with them in a very meaningful way. So a great example here of, of, of how they're doing that. If we look at social in Ireland, because we're talking a lot about social media and, and, and I know a lot of you will be using it as your channel or one of your key channels to reach your target workplace audiences. Why it's so important uh, as a channel, really the stats tell us why. And we can see here that 3.95 million um, people are using social media in Ireland as of January 2022. The average time people in Ireland are spending on social every day is almost two hours. Um, some of the top three channels that they're using for recruitment, LinkedIn, we, we know about, Twitter and Facebook, very, very interesting. And what this tells us is where to be focusing on, especially if you're running paid campaigns, or again, if you're going to create those job adverts, these three channels will have different specifications. So you want to make sure that you're briefing your designer or yourself on, on, on the specs that you need to follow when you're creating those ads. And then again, very, very interesting, female social media users in Ireland. Um, we're going to move on to Caroline now shortly, um, but on the next slide, um, when you go back and reference this in your own time, you'll see some of the channels relevant to the different audiences, and of course, some amazing hashtags to use in your, um, in your communication, should I say, because we know that recruitment um, audiences will be following these, so they'll make you stand out. And again, some really innovative ways that people are um, driving recruitment um, through hiring happy hours, virtual days, and of course, fireside chats. Lots more in there for you to look at in your own time. And with that, I'm gonna pass back um, to Amanda so that we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashton. God, there's so much food for thought there and such great ideas. Um, I'm gonna move very quickly along uh, to introduce Caroline um really but just before i do we're going to take our next poll question and effectively we're asking you the same questions the last time except this time we just want to ask you what's working best for you when you're attracting management and supervisory level staff so is it the same balance uh, between the channels that are actually proving the most effective and while we take the uh, results on that i'm just going to introduce caroline so for those of you who haven't met caroline before caroline's managing director of the hr suite uh, and she works as a HR and employment law expert. As a former member of the Low Pay Commission, she's also adjudicator on the Workplace Relations Commission uh, with expertise as a trainer, um, presenter, keynote speaker, expert investigator, and also a mediator. She's also the author of the book, The Art of Asking the Right Questions. And this is a really excellent practical toolkit, if any of you have picked it up, for managers to ensure that they maximize their people talent and some great tips and guidelines contained in it, actually, around uh, questions within the whole recruitment and uh, interviewing and appraisal and personal development process. So we'll dip into that more uh, in our next webinar. But if we can just take the results of that poll, and I'll hand over then to Caroline uh, to take us through. Okay, so here we're seeing, um, again, in the management supervisory role, maybe a bigger jump in the role and the use of specialist agencies and headhunters and at a management level maybe less international recruitment platforms which is a little bit surprising perhaps um, and also less use of traditional or digital ads so maybe maybe um Ashling's comments there have given you food for thought so without further ado i'll hand you over now to um caroline thanks to so take much us through. Um, lots of really informative um, updates there and I suppose in co correspondence with what everybody else has said, um, my emphasis is going to be just to remind you how important it is that during um, your recruitment process that you ensure that from a legal perspective you're doing the right things. So I'm hopefully going to be able to click on my slides which doesn't seem to be working for me right now. So hopefully that'll come good. Don't you love technology when it goes well? Rachel, I'm going to have to let you magic it there. It doesn't seem to be working for me. Super, thank you. So I suppose the key areas I'm going to cover are the whole areas um, associated with making sure we're legally compliant. So in getting that really great candidate, I'm going to cover the areas on the screen. So I'm going to move on and just start with the diverse workplace. And the key thing to remember as we look at the diverse workplace is it's not just a legal requirement it's hugely important from a culture and a brand perspective that everybody appreciates how important it is that the workplace they are in is so inclusive and welcomes everybody. 
Um, it also means we're going to attract the widest pool of people because as you've seen from the previous presenters, the talent pool now are very specific in what they're looking for and diversity and inclusion is way up there on their priority list. It also gives different perspectives within the work environment, which is absolutely going to add value from a culture and an inclusivity and a positive perspective. So all good reasons to ensure that we are trying to employ as diverse a workplace um, cohort as we can. So key areas to be really conscious of, and these are the pitfall areas in relation to where people end up getting into hot water when they are recruiting. And these are the nine equality grounds you need to be really cautious of to ensure that your recruitment team are really trained well and very aware of these nine areas here on your screen. So, for example, ensuring you're asking every candidate the same consistent question or you're using the same screening criteria so that you're not discriminating somebody in relation to gender, age, disability or any of the other nine grounds. To ensure you're consistent is hugely important to that and keeping clear notes and using a screening process from each stage of the process that you can rely on if anybody comes back and has an issue or wants feedback in relation to why they didn't get through a certain stage is what you need to rely on in relation to that. So discrimination and objective bias can occur both directly or indirectly and the directly means we specifically call out a cohort that we really want to apply so you may specifically say i want a male bartender for example or i want a male night porter and we know how obvious that is in terms of discrimination so it's very unlikely we're going to see that but we're much more likely to see indirect discrimination so we might say applicants where fluent english is their first language need to apply so again, you're discriminating and you're going to cut out a huge cohort who English may not be their first language, but they have enough English to meet the requirements of the job. So just be really aware of any indirect discrimination and be aware of our own objective bias also to ensure that we're not putting any barriers in the way of getting the very best candidate for the role we have open. So one way of ensuring consistency is to consider an application form and you can still accept CVs, absolutely no problem if you feel CVs are more suitable for you, but make a decision on what's best for you in terms of the hiring process. Why we advocate application forms is to ensure all candidates answer the same questions, it can be linked directly to the job, it's easier for screening to the next stage and it allows you gather really good information in relation to the candidate's suitability to a specific job. However, you don't want there to be any barriers to the recruitment process. So if you are doing an application, it needs to be really simple and easy for the candidate to use to apply. And you'll be delighted to see that among many other really great resources, you've got a template application form also available in the support hub. In relation to application forms, you need to ensure you're only asking information that is actually relevant to the job. You need to ensure that you're requesting the same information from all the candidates. And you're also really conscious of your GDPR or your data protection. So you're letting people know in, at the end of the application or during the process in relation to what you're going to be holding in relation to their data. And people are getting a lot more cautious about providing any data. So as you know, in all elements of HR, any data the candidate gives you from the very start of the process, right the way through up to being an employee, needs to be compliant with data protection procedures and compliance standards. So start by ensuring you draft a summary policy of what you're going to do so that all people who are involved in the recruitment process know what they're going to do around data. A key requirement is to ensure confidentiality and keeping the data safe and secure. So whoever is responsible for receiving applications, that's their responsibility. Also agree a timeline in relation to how long you're going to keep that data. So if somebody applies on spec, or somebody applies specifically for a job, how long are you going to keep that data if, for example, they haven't been successful? 
consider what data you have and why it's been processed and ensure you have a policy in relation to unsolicited CVs that might come in but you have no specific job for them and again be clear in relation to your process there to achieve that consistency and ensure everybody is aware of the policy so they're clear. So I'm going to cover a few other key areas that came up as areas of specific interest in relation to some of the legal uh, considerations when you're going to recruit. And one is the area of work permits. So again, be very clear of your employer and employee obligations, because there's equal responsibility here for both the employer and the employee in relation to the legislation. So confirm, does a candidate need a work permit and if they do, make sure that you're complying with the immigration authority requirements and the work permit legislation. So, for example, if they just have a stamp two work permit, which means they're a student working in Ireland, they can only work 20 hours. Make sure that you're keeping records to show compliance with that. So I'm moving on then to the working hours. Again, this is something that came up um, from a recent Fall to Ireland uh, survey in relation to what's really important to candidates and ensuring that people get their breaks and we adhere to the working hours is one that came up very high on that priority list. And again, we have legislation here that requires we keep uh, very detailed records in relation to everybody's start time, when they get their breaks, and also that they work no more than a 48 hour week. We can average that over a period of time. So for example, if you have a particularly busy couple of weeks, you can average that over maybe a two month or a three month period. But make sure that you keep corresponding records to show that everybody gets their breaks and everybody gets um, the right number of hours between shifts and also working time. And this is an area particularly the WRC would audit in the hospitality sector because it often comes up as an issue. Two other areas that came up in that survey, particularly of relevance also to candidates, is the rostering. And even though we're obliged to give a certain amount of notice, which is at least 24 hours before the first day of the work in terms of that uh, week ahead, candidates particularly said they don't mind working unusual hours and they're used to that requirement to be flexible, but they want as much notice of the roster so they can plan around it as possible. So I think that's going to be something that really helps your employer branding, not alone with your attraction, but also with your retention. And also be aware of the specific obligations you have if you employ night workers. And finally, young persons at work. Um, as we're now expanding the talent pool, and particularly as we come into seasonal employment, be aware of the fact that if you have under 18s working for you, specific guidelines are relevant to them. And we've produced a fact sheet, which will be available in the support hub, which will outline the hours, the time off between shifts, the routine in relation to breaks and the requirement around consent and also the requirement to keep additional records if you do employ young persons at work. And it's particularly useful to obviously capture good talent uh, for later on in the recruitment process. So it's really important that we do take on the wor young workers but have the right obligations. And finally, in keeping with the theme today, I think the key uh, advice I'd give is you can still be legally compliant and ensure consistency and good records, but it's all about recruiting for attitude and training for aptitude. So, Amanda, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thanks, Caroline. And I'm just very conscious of time, folks. So I'm just going to very quickly go into some questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, and while I do that, we might just take the last poll of the day. Um, we have started to notice that some businesses are now using recruitment software as a kind of a recruitment plug-in, maybe to HR software that they're using to support the recruitment process. So just interested to know if anybody is out there using it. Uh, do you use it and what do you find it most effective uh, for in that regard? So um, if we can just take the answers to that, uh, and I'm going to go straight to, to the panel while we uh, collate the answers there. And just uh, if we can have the panel please on screen. Um, I just have a few questions from the audience in the interest of time. So I'll ask you to keep your answers very quickly uh, and qu very brief and short. Sorry. Chris, you described this marketplace as fast. Can you just tell us in a nutshell what we're really talking about here? What's changed? Um, I think it's 
it, well, it's everything. P people want uh, to apply quickly, but they, they, they want to come out the other end quickly as well. So what's really important, actually something I always, often advise people to do is apply for your own job, see how annoying the process is, and then change <laughs> it uh, to, to make it less annoying because it's the feedback loop. You need to close it all off really, really fast. And I want, I, I want to apply and I want an answer now. Yeah, and, and that's a great piece of advice. Mystery shop your own experience. Um, and I suppose it also, you know, plays to the fact that actually so much of these, you know, people are actually, you know, they're having, you know, I know some of my kids' friends have had two and three interviews in the one day and, and they're kind of making a decision based on who comes back to them first with the best offers. You know what I mean? Once they're, they feel that their, their, their values are aligned with. Uh, Caroline, a tough one for you. What's the best hire characteristic uh, and why... Why is it so? And, and how do you look for it on an application or a CV? Um, it is a tough one. Um, I suppose if I could pick two, positivity and customer service, um, because okay. I think you need the positivity, but you also need customer service if you're working in hospitality, no matter what job. And I suppose I'm a big fan, and we'll be covering it in the next session, of behavioural competency-based interview questions, and we'll really delve into those in the next session. Great, great answer. And I suppose that's really interesting because a lot of people are saying they're not seeing people come with the experience they need, but yet maybe it's that we're failing to recognise the talents that people are bringing in. And I suppose that brings me to my next question from, from a busy HR manager who has sent us in from the audience. And this is what I'm putting to Natasha. I get CVs submitted from my job adverts from people who've applied but don't have the experience and their CD, CV doesn't match all the skills I'm looking for. Natasha, what do I do? I think in that situation, you look at it at it positively. Um, I coach lots of people, different levels, entry through to executive. One factor across all of them is the fact that they don't know how to create their CV. They don't know how to put their work experience into black and white, and they need help with that. So it's an opportunity to have a conversation, maybe aligning someone up during the week to, have, to spend an hour speaking to those candidates and see what potential opportunities that they might have in skills for you as an employer um, and actually, you know, engaging, exactly, having the communication all the way through. But that's a, people do not know how to complete their CVs. That's the problem. They don't know how to put what they've done previously and showcase themselves well. So it is an opportunity to show the, 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 the transferable skills. And I suppose that plays into some of the innovations, Ashling, that you were talking about. And Chris, I think you mentioned as well, and yourself, Natasha, you know, the fact that sometimes there's a place for a, maybe a, um, an informal chat uh, as part of that screening process. So you can actually draw out the, those talents from the candidate and get a feel for them and they can get a feel for you. Yeah, great, great, great answer. Ashling, one last question here from a really small business in the audience. We've no employer branding. Where should I begin with creating an identity and a tone of voice that you talk about for the recruitment drive? Sure, um, and Amanda, three things I would focus on is tailoring, packaging, and presenting. So tailoring is looking at who is it that you're trying to target? So what does that workplace audience look like? Um, how are you going to reach them? So your channels, and then when we package it, look at what your core values are, what you stand for, what makes you different, and look beyond the day-to-day -day job in terms of benefits. We saw with the Armada, it's all about the C. So that's packaging it, and then presenting it is then working with a designer or Canva to create that visual that's going to really um, attract across social media and any other channels that you decide to use. Brilliant, thanks very much. Folks, I don't think we have time for anything else. I'm just going to quickly ask um, Rachel just to put up our slides again, and I'll just maybe step through just some key takeaways um, from today. Uh, so if we can just move on there. Um, just wanted to draw your attention to the research uh, that was done, the workforce research that was done by Forge Ireland. Uh, I know any of you who met with Jenny DeSaul in our recent Industry Day presentations would have heard this in more detail. There's a copy of that recording on Tourism uh, Careers page on the Forge Ireland site. But just to call out a few things here, you know, in, in regard to this, 62% of employers surveyed mentioned that competitors were the problem. We have a load of ideas from today's webinar, and I've called out a few here in terms of ways that you can look at addressing that. Um, Caroline spoke about this as well, you know, the fact that employees are seeking better basic pay. Chris alluded to it as well. You know, we need to actually be mindful and look out to the competitive industries and understand what they're doing. The minimum rates of pay have changed as of January this year, so we need to make sure that we're keep in keeping with that. 
Uh, but also, in, interestingly and importantly, that 54% of the employees surveyed were saying that perks beyond pay are important. And given that 74% of the audience surveyed uh, in this workforce survey of over 5,000 people indicated that they actually wanted to create a career in the industry and stay in the industry, it's very reassuring if we get these few hygiene factors right. Uh, and I think, you know, in both the example road profiles that Natasha has spoken about today and the ones that are in the resources that we've given you uh, and what Ashling and Chris have spoken to, you know, around the perks outside of the basic pay, there's some really great ideas and suggestions here for you to have a browse at in, in your own time. And always, I think, be mindful of the fact that, you know, your own existing employees should be your greatest resource. Uh, as an ambassador and a champion for people coming in. And I know for particularly the Gen Z generation, they will look to find somebody they know working there to get the background check and the inside track on what they're like to work for before they'll make a decision even to a, a, apply. So consider what your existing employees are saying about you and just make sure that your rates are competitive uh, against others in similar sectors. So just to look at the key takeaways then, I mean, there's been so much information shared here today. If we can move on to the next slide. I think it's important to say that the marketplace has changed, so we do need to adapt. So that 30% that called out at the end of the day that nothing has changed for the last two years, I think this is time now to change. Uh, we need to establish the employer brand and articulate the USPs. And I think that came through right the way through from Natasha talking about the generations to Chris talking about the importance of it for standout and point of difference, and Ashley then presenting how that shows up in your ads and your creatives. Understanding and considering the needs and motivations of those workforce segments. So accepting the fact that not everybody wants the same thing from a job in our industry, and we need to talk to their different needs and motivations and better understand them, and better understand that need, as Chris said, for kind of work-life balance as well. Uh, and there's some really innovative examples, actually, I spotted one last night coming in from the Munster Technical University of calling out that, you know, uh, employers who are actually working to rebalance uh, that work-life balance in the industry uh, and attract people um, with that mindset um, in, in their job ads. Applying the best marketing skills, the minds and techniques to craft your ads. So we're very good at marketing from an, a service and a product point of view, but we need to apply that, apply that same skills and expertise when it comes to marketing our job adverts. Our, our workforce audiences are no different. They're motivated and stimulated by the personalization and being able to see themselves in that role and align to your brand values. Optimizing the recruitment marketing channels. Uh, I think it's fair to say, you know, there was good examples of that across uh, from your poll surveys, uh, but actually just not, not to forget to understand the role uh, that our existing employees can play in their in as ambassadors and as champions and that might be in small video vignettes back of house tours you know uh, easy chats with prospective applicants uh, and the recruitment trade fairs and getting to know the people and the teams you're going to be potentially working with and then finally we can't ignore the fact that we need to be realistic about rates of pay and benefits in light of what other competitive sectors are doing and start to recognize you know you're paying people for the talent not always the experience as 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 you know uh, caroline spoke to you can train for the skills but actually if they have the right attitude that's the talent that you're buying in and that's the talent you're you're addressing in your rates of pay and benefits so you know that i think i suppose hopefully sums up uh, what we've seen come across from the expert contributors today i want to say huge thanks to the panel that we've had here with us uh, and finally, just to issue a reminder to you that the next webinar, uh, if we can uh, move along, the next webinar is coming to you on Tuesday of next week at the new time of three o'clock. Uh, and there we'll be talking about the whole area of how the interviewing process has changed in what is a talent uh, marketplace uh, and how we need to change what we're doing and the way we're interviewing in that space. So that happens at three o'clock next week. And then the following webinar, the final in the series, which will look at actually onboarding uh, new staff and actually how to do that in a way that optimizes their performance, beds them into the organization, makes them feel connected, drives an effective induction program so they feel connected and it supports retention in the long term. So we'll be back to you on those two in the next two weeks. Uh, and just to finally remind you again 
all of the supports and resources we've spoken about today will be available to you on the Business Support Hub from tomorrow. We'll drop you a communication on that. Don't forget to look at our upcoming support program schedule of other training available to your staff uh, as you prepare to um, um, accelerate into the season ahead. And we really look forward to that season. I'd say some of you are out there looking forward to their first day at work without face masks. Uh, in the last two years. And I'm looking forward to actually going in as a customer with no face mask. So look, without further ado, thank you all for staying with us. I know we've run slightly over time. Uh, have a good afternoon and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks everybody, have a good day. Early one Monday morning, and I was on my way to school. I it was early one morning, and I was on my way to school. Yeah, that was the morning. I'm in love with you, baby. Before I learn to call your name, I am in love with you, baby. Before I learn to call your name. Somewhere else. I know that's gonna drive me insane.